Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to BPI. I'm Dee O'Neill. I'm head of our corporate and executive programs. You are in for a treat tonight. Who already knows Bonnie Pittman? A lot of you. <laughs> This is the Friends of Bonnie stacked, Pittman talk. <laughs> but last time Bonnie spoke, about a year ago, mm -hmm. I think it was, afterwards, many, not as many knew you. Yes, right. But I said after her talk, if you didn't know Bonnie before, who's in love with Bonnie now? <laughs> and it was like yeah. everywhere. So you're in for a treat if you know or you don't know Bonnie. So quick announcement. You have at your table just a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of promo for us. We are the application arm of the research from the Center for Brain Health Next Door. Okay. So we focus on programs to help individuals to optimize and enhance their brain performance. We have lots of new programming, this event being one of them, the Sips and Science Speaker Series that Bonnie is kicking, up for, kicking off for us today. Uh, we took off the summer, but every month, the third Thursday, we try to make it. We bring in subject matter experts, amazing speakers to share with you cutting edge research and interesting, fun, exciting topics. So one event we have that you'll see the flyer for I wanna highlight is October 17th, um, High Tea with Darren McCready. Darren is the former personal chef to Queen Elizabeth II, as well as Princess Diana and, Princess William and uh, Prince William and Harry. So uh, Darren will be doing a high tea. Okay. We'll have some bubbly before and just a fun okay. um, event. So please register and come and think about um, attending that event. So without further ado, I want to get um, this party started because it's going to be so, such, a, such a fun evening. Bonnie Pittman is our, I'm going to read these because it's kind of a, a mouthful. She is our distinguished scholar, the Edith O'Dell Institute of Art History, and she is our <coughs> director of Art Brain Innovations. And so she is going to kick off today with her Do Something New speaker series. And just so you know, she will be also starting a workshop first of early 2019 that we're yeah. super excited to have her kick off. So without further ado, Ms. Bonnie Pippen. Thank you. Well, I should say how grateful I am for all of you coming out in this weather and uh, to all my dear friends and uh, colleagues from the university and the art museum, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, some of you know this story, um, which is, oh, I have to remember to hold the clicker, okay, which is um, that I started out, this is the first time I've been Whitney Spears, so we took a picture of it tonight because it was this, this thing, up. yeah, I took it off, right. Um, all right, we're working on this. Um, let's see. Can I get it back in? No. Um, it it de definitely, <laughs> as I stick it in my eye, is something. As I stick it in my eye, is something new. All right. I think we should not touch it. That's what I've been trying not to do. <coughs> right, except for it's right in front of my eye. <laughs> All right, we're ready. Yeah, don't touch it. Okay. How is that? I think it's okay. You can hear me. Oh, uh, it's all right. Uh, it's just as it not touching my eye is good. Okay, here's Oscar. It's okay, isn't it? Well, well, Katrina's here. We'll put it, plug it back in. Who knows? Um, I uh, came to Dallas in 2000 to start work at the Dallas Museum of Art and had the most creative set of experiences, including uh, opening up the courtyard and doing branding for the museum because it looked like uh, people saw our banner. It was black and it had three white letters at DMA. And when I did the testing, people said, oh, yes, that's the Dallas Mortuary Association. <laughs> so we knew something had to be done and uh, embarked on a big campaign to rebrand the museum and put up signage and open up the courtyard which you probably don't remember was completely enclosed here at the main entrance. And during the time that I was there, it was one of the happiest moments in my career because the staff is so extraordinarily creative. The board was very supportive and willing to take risks. And we did amazing projects, including King Tut, which was um, a, 
I was the lead negotiator for 12 museums in the United States. But also, I am convinced that King Tut is the reason I got sick. Um, the museum, making the museum a place for people was definitely a, a part of the work that we do so that uh, when I came, I hate to say this, there were 200,000 people coming to the museum. And um, that's if you counted every docent and every staff member coming in. And so it was, and most of those were school groups. So we had to do something to really re-engage the institution with the community, and we launched a huge campaign which the store staff and board got behind to make it an educational learning space. And while I was there, one in every two people that came to the museum were involved in, in programming, public programming. So it made a huge difference in how people felt about the institution. But um, the great part of being a museum director is you travel all the time. And I went to London, Paris, Rome, you know, and New York negotiating shows and doing wonderful things. Um, but I got sick in one of those trips in 2008. And we thought it was just the flu. And when I came back, because that's what you get. And unfortunately, it wasn't. It's something I still um, have today in my lungs. And so I had to learn what to do um, with my life. I was the director of the museum, and I didn't want to quit that job at all. And so this horrifying picture is one that I did while I was in the first end of the first uh, second year when I was so angry at my body and furious at myself that I couldn't get better, um, that I was, I'd go out to an event and come back, and pretty much Dr. Rosenblatt saw me two days later at the clinic and said, oh, we should just go right over to Roberts and put you in the hospital again. And it was a cycle that needed to be broken. And when I told him that I was going to retire from the museum, Randy said it was a really, really good decision. But I didn't know what I was going to do, and um, it was a very lonely um, lonely part of my life. And the decision was complicated because so much of my time is spent at Baylor Hospital. Just for today alone, I've been, I was there from 8 until 12.30. And so many days are filled with clinics and, and um, the pinch me, punch me, and poke, poke me team. And um, But in between all of that, there are these amazing doctors and nurses and people who run the arts and um, arts in medicine program that we've launched to make Baylor a more creative and special place if you're going to be a patient there. So my Baylor days have not gone away, but they are moderated by um, a practice that I developed the summer um, after I retired from the museum. So my question to myself is, how do you make an ordinary day when you're caught up in this whirlwind of things going over and over again, repeating themselves? Um, and just trying to breathe to make it extraordinary. And so that was the question I posed for myself. And it was not an easy question to answer, um, but I just developed a practice, which I'll tell you about. And today is day 2,632. So I, yes, <laughs> you know, just when I think I'm going to give it up. <laughs> I, um, just when I think I'm going to give it up, I keep going because how could I not now? <laughs> the first year or two, it would have been easy to drop, but now I, I'd be really upset with myself. So what are these new experiences? And people ask me this question all the time. How do you have time to do it? And my answer is, how do you have time not to do it? Um, because there are 1,400 uh, 40 minutes in a day, and that's a lot of time, and you can take... 10 minutes to meditate or 10 minutes to go enjoy being in a walk in a field or talking, listening carefully to a friend. There are lots of things you can do each day to really change it. So this is the real story that um, Randy called me and said uh, after a biopsy that the virus unfortunately was still there. It was July 8, 2011. And um, I was in the parking lot, picking up my brother at Southwest Airlines getting this news. And it was pretty depressing um, because I thought, isn't it my turn to be well and come out on the other side after two and a half years? And um, so when I came home, I told my brother and he said, well, why don't you go take a nap? So I did. 
And when I woke up from my nap, I, you know how you have a little pad of paper by your desk and bed and you write down things? Well, this is what I wrote down. And it, I made a decision to try this practice of doing something new every day, to take an ordinary day and to make it extraordinary through intention. And what the reality of that was I said, well, how are you gonna do that? And so I wrote down these eight principles or of my practice, which is what has guided me. And so new places, new people, new experiences. Wonderful thing that I did is new experiences with old friends, because I would have really been sad not to have that. Um, they can be big or little things because sometimes I'm not strong enough to do a big thing. I'm strong enough to do, um, I call on my dear friends and say, okay, we have to figure out what to do. And it could be bringing me tea or uh, some flowers that we'll arrange together. And thank God I wrote down new flavors of ice cream. <laughs> Although I have developed type 2 diabetes in the course of all this, but, but it is my one saving point, and I get teased by my doctors all the time about it. I eat a lot less than I did in the beginning. Um, it cannot be work or medical, so anything related to that doesn't count. And I cannot carry forward, and that means that in, at the end of the day, you know, 11.45, I'm still awake. Um, if I haven't done something new, I'm going to do something new. So there have been a lot of nights of rummaging through the house or running outside and dancing under the stars or, you know, blowing up balloons and making balloon animals. I'll do anything to get it done. And so, because I'm not about to give up. So I'm going to tell you about um, a couple of the aspects of the practice just so that you get a sense of how the variety and um, the importance. And I take a lot of photographs. Many of you who know me bear with me about this. And the photographs, I now have 46,000 photographs on my iPhone. And um, they are the story of my life. And it's just really important. So my brother called me and said he was coming to to Dallas, and they wanted to go down to Waco. Waco, I said, what are we going to Waco for? Well, there's a couple that have created a whole industry of refurbishing houses, of which I have no interest in. And so <laughs> I research Waco. <laughs> and so it's the first suspension bridge in America that was built. This uh, architect went on to build the Brooklyn Bridge. So I was this fountain of informa useless information for my brothers and everybody else. It was push the, you know, let me tell you all about the sculptures that are by the, by the uh, famous river here. Anyhow, I went to Waco. So that was, and I insisted that we go to the uh, Boy Scouts Museum, which is down there. But the only part is it has a lot of mold. So I only made two rooms. Um, I said new flavors of ice cream, and this is an advertisement for Botino, which is this great new ice cream store that one of our friends introduced us to. It was my day, um, day 2600, and so a group of us decided to celebrate, and um, down we went. We, I ate four new flavors of ice cream that day, not one. <laughs> it was a grand day, <coughs> and um, met the chef who is fourth generation making these incredible gelatos. And if you like gelatos like we do, um, I highly recommend it. It's down on Greenway. Um, a dear friend and a well-regarded artist, John Pamaro, um, did these murals over uh, just across the street, actually, literally at the end of um, Forest Park in the cancer um, uh, radiation um, area and new building, new section of this building. And so there are these huge nine foot walls, John? 12, 12 foot walls. And he was commissioned to make these incredible panels that go down them and that are filtered in these uh, extraordinarily and riveting color covers, colors. And it's part of the program that I'm involved with over there, which is decorating the, uh, not decorating, but adding art to the environment at Baylor, with, uh, at UT Southwestern, which we hope someday to do at Baylor. But John was nice enough to invite me down for the day that they were being hung. And so all the intricacies, the things behind the scene, like how you fix the little section that isn't quite right um, and adjust them, um, it was great to go through that with you, John. So I have to say a big part of my do something new practice are my friends reaching out to me and saying, let's do something new together, or they're doing something new. And they say, I wonder if you've done this. So it's been just amazing. Um, 
Another part of new places is I create my own, I have a very vivid imagination, as you can imagine, and I create my own world in lots of different ways. And so this was one of my extended stays at Baylor, and I have to walk around the center of Baylor Roberts is this horrible hallway that you walk around over and over and over and over again until you build up your stamina so that you can get Dr. Rosenblatt to release you. And so <laughs> I decided one day not to be there anymore. And so I emailed all my friends and said, I'm going to Venice. And so people all over Dallas and all over the United States got this email. I forgot to say that I'm in the hospital. So they all wrote back and said, we thought you were sick and what's going on. And I said, no, 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 I'm going to Venice in my mind. So over the course of the next three days, all these images and poems and music arrived on my iPad. And it was extraordinary. And if you came into my room, you know, Vivaldi was playing. And if you went through, saw what I was looking at, it wasn't all the, you know, pumped pinch me, punch me, and poke me things. I was looking at pictures of Venice, which I love. It's one of my favorite cities. And then all the great um, artwork that's been created. This is a sample of a piece from Monet. And just doing those comparisons back and forth. And it was a great escape. It was really the first time that I realized that um, place is a matter of your mind. It's not just, uh, you don't, where you physically are doesn't have to be where you spiritually and um, emotionally have to be. So Venice is one of my favorite stories. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, new people. I love meeting new people. This is one of my favorite things. And um, this year, uh, I got, I was lucky enough, I, I was actually for the first time in a number of years, uh, healthy enough to get on the plane and go not to see my family, because that's always a precious gift, but to go on a meditation retreat with my son for five days. And we went and studied with Sharon Salzberg and um, Joseph Goldstein, two of the great meditators. And David and I have practiced meditation since he was a teenager, and he's written books about it. He's standing right beside me. But I met all these amazing people, and they formed what's called an action sangha. So it's a group of people that practice meditation and are doing social good. And so we follow up with emails, and we have convenings in New York, and it's been an extraordinary experience to meet, you know, 15 new people and keep them in your heart. And Sharon Salzberg, who's in the front, is had I have heard her voice for years, but I had never met her. And um, she, because when I started meditating intensely, she was a big part of it. And Jack uh, Joseph was also, and so they have all these books and tapes and everything. And you don't even. I don't know how to describe it. You hear their voices going to sleep and waking up in different times. And so when I met her, it was like, oh my God, the Buddha is here. You know? So it was an, a great, a great experience for me. I keep hitting the wrong button, for which I apologize. Another part of something new is meeting all different kinds of people, two of them are here today. Um, my new neighbor at um, where I live is Mary uh, John Hill. She's 102, and um, I try to have lunch, uh, lunch or dinner with her once, once a week to just you know take care of her and be with her. And she's so sweet and wonderful, and that's her daughter. And then I met Grace and Jesse um, here at one of the uh, Brain Performance Institute events, and we've had dinner. So. It's more than just meeting people, it's bringing them into your life, like Pam has done. So watch out. Um, <laughs> that's all I can say. You <laughs> Never be surprised. I have a wonderful friend here, Jim, um, who heard me in October and uh, last year for the opening events. And he gave me his little card and said, you know, someday if you want to talk about your PowerPoint, give me a call. And in January, I called him. <laughs> and we've been having meetings trying to get the PowerPoint. PowerPoint better and strengthen the voice, um, get more emotion in it, and, and make it better, a better story, not just a roll of information. And so I thank you, Jim, for doing that for me. And then my dear friend, Courtney, who is at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and I go to the galleries all the time. So we um, head out on Fridays and have these wonderful days meeting new people. 
I had never been to a baseball game, period, and I certainly had never been to the Rangers. And I have wonderful friends who um, were kind enough, first of all, couldn't believe that, and then were <laughs> kind enough to take me. And I had this incredible seat, seat on the uh, down at the early, what do you call it, Ken? The, the front row, right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a seat on the front row. <laughs> And um, the thing that I wanted most in the world was a ba bag of Cracker Jacks. And um, Ken reminded me that a very famous player did photobond one of my images, which I have to go back and find because I didn't know he was a very famous player. <laughs> I was happy with the Cracker Jacks. So this gets into big and little. You know, big was being at the at the um, at the event, and little is my sheer joy in eating a bag of Cracker Jacks. So new experiences are very important, and they help. You know, by by putting yourself, forcing yourself to go into new experiences and disrupting your daily routine, it really helps your brain to grow in, in lots of different ways, which you'll see later. This was, one of the, the, this was one of the treats I've gone on. See how beautiful and meditative. You're not supposed to take pictures during the retreat, although sometimes I do, and then I get in trouble, but that's okay. And who, who hasn't? How many of you have had breakfast with a dinosaur? That's what I want to know. <laughs> So um, this is my little grandson, Clark, who woke up one morning, and he loves to wear costumes. So he said, Nana, I'm going to be a dinosaur, pulls it out of the closet. It's 6 AM in the morning, which is not my prime time. And we get fully dressed, trying to eat breakfast with a dinosaur hat, which is constantly falling off. But he then wore this same costume for lunch and for dinner, took his nap in it. He was a dinosaur for the entire day, but um, I'll never, never forget. Okay. Um, this is looking at art. Um, how many of you have been to the uh, Nasher Sculpture Center and seen the Donald Judd install there? Yeah. It, every time I go, depends on the day of light, and there's a side angle looking down that long, purple blue tube that you can see. And this is the same um, view of that looking down the long tube on different days. And so that, uh, that ma the magic of, of experiencing something that you saw once before, but how can I see it differently? And so um, art is one of the great motivators in my life, and it's the thing I love the most. Um, I have a dear friend who loves theater, and so now I have a practice of trying to go to theater so that we can have more personal conversations about it. And we went to see the band's visit. Have any of you seen that in New York? It was amazing. It was an amazing show. And it was all about the power of people and in the moment changing people's lives. And that incredible quality of love in all its different manifestations and the musical um, was just terrific. So it's an Egyptian uh, band coming into Israel to play a concert, and they got stuck overnight in a very, very small town. And um, it was, you know, in art, the stories of the world are told. And so we just need to um, pause sometimes and, and let that beauty into our lives. So these are just simple ones. Um, I have uh, the great thing is now I can tell different stories, but I'm just going to show you one image. New experiences with old friends really critical. Um, I don't mean that they're old; it's just that they're not new friends. <laughs> and um, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, that was a, a project that uh, John did down on um, a couple of years ago, and Jeremy, a good friend, knew that I couldn't go on my own, so he picked me up and took me. Um, new experiences can be big or little. There's a lot of that in my life. On good days, <laughs> on good days, we take a lot of risks. And and on on quiet, I don't call them sick days. I call them quiet days. Um, it you know you just celebrate that moment um, and whatever can be. And yes, new flavors of ice cream. I'm going to write a book about this. And on at the end of the book, there's going to be an entire couple of pages with just all the new flavors of ice cream that I've had over eight years, which must be in a phenomenal list. And I've kept a record of all of them. Um, so here's a question. What have you all done that's something new? I'm going to ask like four or five people to tell me. And the, today, the past three days, yes. Yes. Good job. Now, nobody else can use that one. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. I met a new friend tonight. 
Good. Great. Birthday. At a birthday. That's awesome. And you? I learned how to change a deck plate on my sailboat. Wow. <laughs> that is impressive. Okay. This side of the room, Pat. Oh. <laughs> we, we live in the same building. Yeah. We're friends and we see each other all the time. Yeah. But it's the first time I've heard you speak and really got in the full body. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Cynthia. I crawled in the back, in the front from where I was sitting tonight. I crawled in my dress to the back of my SUV because I knew there was a big umbrella. <laughs> Yay! Go, girl! I'm going to ask you how to do that because I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody needs to edit that letter. <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> yeah. That is, and over there. Oh, wow. Wow. Amazing. Um, so, I mean, it's just amazing. You just need to reflect back on your life of the day, and you'll be surprised how things, a lot of you will probably be saying, oh, my gosh, I did fill in the blank. Um, and it's, it's a powerful thing. We go through life, and we don't remember it. And the power of this message is really, you know, be joyful, be happy, but, but take time to really celebrate it. So I've learned a lot um, during my Something New process. Of course, I learned a lot about chronic illness. That was in the early phases. I just wanted it to go away and um, erase from my vocabulary and not be part of me. But I'm not going to read this slide, but I think the one thing up on the top is that I realized that I had company. I was not alone. And it was a very big part of understanding the issue um, uh, of, of being chronically ill. And um, that's technically defined by the National Health Institute as having a, a disease that can't be cured in six months. And we had long passed that point. And so um, I had to admit that I had chron a chronic illness. And now we have several, but that's okay. Oh, that's a really great slide. Um, I learned since I came here last uh, October, an amazing about uh, about the brain, and want to encourage all of you to take part in this. Um, Ginny Holland, where are you, Ginny? Over there, there she is. Is one of my main guides and teachers, along with Sandy Chapman and Leanne Young, who have taken me on this journey um, to understanding. This is a creative an intuitive practice up until this point. And then I learned that, oh my gosh, it has a lot to do with improving brain function and all of these other things. Um, my, I think that what we need to fundamentally understand is you don't lose brain cells as you get older, you make new brain cells. But if you don't actively pursue that activity, they will go away and you will become um, less attentive, less have less memory. But the fact that it's um, dynamic, that was the word I really liked up there, and adaptable um, gave me a lot of courage. Um, in, in my practice. And the other thing is that there are neuroscientists all over here. It's very scary. And I am not, I am not a neuroscientist. So Jenny helped uh, to put together this wonderful um, uh, validation of what's going on. A lot of the work in Do Something New is in intentionally designed to provoke curiosity and, and, and help your brain to think about those things. And it activates the two uh, parts of your brain that are very, very important. The frontal cortex, which is where your strategic thinking and your um, executive functions, uh, creativity, and lots of other things are har um, fostered in that. And then the hippocampus, which is the thing I love the most. I want to know, how do I create more memories? What can I do? And then there are all these brain chemicals that are uh, uh, what is the word? <laughs> released, released in your brain as you begin to do something so that you feel good. So, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I have to. I, 
they have to have a stinger on me. So if I go back one slide, this is, um, this is why, and now I know why I do it. <laughs> this was the revelation that, that the very actions of the do something new practice are very much about problem solving. People often say, oh, you're so creative. I'm not creative. I just do things um, that give me joy. And I'm very curious. I want to learn all the time, sometimes at risk. Um, and there's just an, and social relationships are very, very important to me. Um, and uh, I love fostering them and engaging in them sometimes at my own risk um, because <laughs> my grandchildren often have viruses and then they happily give them to me, but that's all right. That's called a relationship. It's just, <laughs> just defined in different ways. Um, and then I give them to Randy and <laughs> Dr. Rosenblatt gets them. Not me from me, but he just says, why did we do that? Um, <laughs> negative, um, you know, I could be, have been ended up very depressed. You know, there's no question that what I go through and what I've been through is not has been a challenging um, ch chapters. It's now almost eight years in my life, but I didn't want to do that. So the do something new practice keeps me outward bound, and um, all the things over there are not what I wanted in my life. So intuitively, I pushed against them and created a new world for me. I'm pushing it in the right way. I think the lesson um, from all of this is that the do something new practice. This is the great Shiva Nataraja at the Dallas Museum of Art. It was the first work that came into the collection when I arrived, and it's one of my favorite ones. And that is Shiva, who is the creator and destroyer. And he's dancing so intensely there that the flames of life are surrounding him, and he's putting out ignorance. And for me, he really represents that resilience, that power um, that comes from regeneration. And that is what this story is really about. It's about against all odds, we're going to heal. So these, these are all the things I learned, 10 things. Um, happily, you won't have to listen to 10 stories, but I'll give you a few of them. Um, one of my favorite and one of the most important was I had practiced meditation in the 1980s in Berkeley. And then all of a sudden, I uh, came to Dallas, and there was a void here in terms of uh, people. And although I met, began to meet new people, but it was not a place where you could really study meditation and uh, have a, I was at, a, I had practiced Zen meditation, which is intense. So, but when I got sick, uh, my son was the one who turned to me and said, Mom, you really need to uh, start reading and listening to tapes and uh, going online and hearing these people. And so it was a very big part of that revelation. And this year, one of the great moments for me was uh, a chance to go to another great teacher's uh, in meditation, John Kabat-Zinn, with a dear friend who... Um, came up with me and is there <laughs> and stayed for an entire week. And even in silence, we had 36 hours of silent retreat, which you don't say anything, no cell phones, no phones, no books, no nothing. You are in your head and your head alone. And it's been a wonderful thing. And I do it um, every day uh, during the day because at home it's an important thing. But meditation doesn't always have to be sad and quiet or distant. It can be very lively. And this is a practice that I learned from John Kabat-Zinn about meditating on a raisin. And so I took it home to my grandchildren. And when I'm with them every day, when I'm up visiting them, they'll wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and say, Nana! time to do meditation on the raisin. And, <laughs> and I'm like, really? Now you want to do meditation on the raisin? So what you do is you take uh, a raisin and you examine it. You look at the colors, try to see as many different colors as you can. You have to give little children more than one raisin. Uh, they can't hold out. And this is little Clark down there looking at all the little colors, you know, and oh, Nan, I see gold in this one. Great. And then you take a bite of the raisin. You can't swallow the whole raisin raisin and you take one bite and you savor it and you feel that sweetness going down your throat and then you take the next one and then we tell the story of how the raisin came to be from being planted all the way in
into the harvesting, into the city, to the trucks, to the store, and then mom and dad um, uh, buying it and bringing it uh, to us. To, uh, the raisin lady, you know, and uh, Sun Made Raisins gets this long extended meta or offering of, uh, of, of kindness and good practice because we're grateful. We're grateful that these raisins came to us. So this is this fun activity that we do every day. Drives my son crazy because he's trying to get them to school. But um, we have decided meditation on the raisin is more important. Oh, good, Bonnie. <laughs> You were all kind enough to do that. I didn't think about it. Um, living in the moment with all of your senses. A very important part of the practice is not um, isolating it to your head or to one thing. But like the meditation on the raisin, it can take, you know, um, taking time to really savor food, taking time to really listen deeply in your daily life to people that are around you. When my brothers annually send me Florida oranges, of course, and when they come, there's a whole ceremony of unpacking them and tasting them and cutting them, and it can take 30 minutes to get one orange down. And sometimes I have friends over, and sometimes I just do it by myself because it's such a pleasure. But the whole idea is to be grateful for this extraordinary event in our lives that we know how this food came to me. The, Seeing new things with art is, of course, a big, big part of my life. And um, the Nasher Sculpture Center and the DMA are my two homes. And this was a day looking at the Richard Serra and just moving around through the sculpture. There were 30 photographs that I took just from that one experience, looking down the corridors, looking up at the light. And that seeing something, it's Corton steel, it's not very beautiful at its outset, but it's very beautiful once you experience it. Oh, I'm telling you, I shouldn't have this lower button. Um, compassion, being compassionate is a critical part of um, the practice, and uh, it comes in many forms uh, because it requires being compassionate for yourself, and this was a powerful, powerful day for me. I was at the DMA and took a lots of photographs of the beautiful Kayabat up on the second floor. It's one of my favorite pen paintings that Mrs. McDermott purchased, and I was involved in that. And I just was blown away at these strokes of paint and how glorious it was. And the painting originally was done by Kayabat, and when he died, Degas bought it, and it was in Degas' estate when he died, and so it, oh, loving artists had cared for it, and then it went into private hands. So it was, there's stories and everything, but mostly I was captivated by the paint. And that day I had, uh, the next day, excuse me, I had an infusion, and they couldn't get the needles in my arm, so we busted two veins, and we're headed into the third vein, and it was a long afternoon, and the nurses were terrific, but my veins don't always cooperate. So what I did is I pulled out my iPhone and I just sat there meditating on these beautiful flowers. And I had no idea what was going on. And it, I think S -S -S Cynthia was in the room, and Cynthia and Susan were in the room for part of this as I just sort of, okay, we're not gonna be here, we're going someplace else. <laughs> and it's a, the gift of art, you know, the gift of art and healing, it's one of the most powerful things. Um, being compassionate for others, I, I think if I ask that question, most people, how many of you are compassionate with yourself? You know, like seven hands went up. Okay, how many of you are compassionate with others? Yeah, the hands all go up. So it is um, caring for other people, doing purposeful acts where you reach out and help someone else is really an extraordinary part of living. And uh, I, I wish I could always do more because you feel good when you do it. And there are a lot of things that come out of being compassionate that are great for your brain and great for your soul and spirit. And uh, I think that it's an important lesson. Um, these, this story here is an amazing one because I was abandoned on uh, American Airlines ramp that they take me out because I'm in a wheelchair. 45 minutes later in 100 degree heat, I was still sitting there wondering when is somebody coming for me? And um, finally the pilot, uh, Jim, came out and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, not intentionally am I here. I think my next ch chance is to go to Cincinnati, which is what they're getting the plane ready for. And so he grabbed the wheelchair 
and rolled me up and then took care of getting me water and getting care of all of the getting me uh, people that would properly get me out of the out of the airport. And I wrote to American Airlines and said, this is a story you need to know. And tracked down the vice president of uh, services, you know, uh, um, guest services, and said, you really have to thank him for me. But you, uh, I know I can't thank him, and but you, he, you need to know that you have staff that are so extraordinary in life. And he saved my day. The other things that happen is over on the other side is one of the beautiful harpists. One time when I was at Baylor for a really long time, they set up the music program, which is part of the art and medicine program. And for me, every day, I was lucky enough, a harpist or a violinist came into my room and played. And it made such a difference to me um, because when you're there more than three days, it gets pretty boring. And it was a highlight of my day. It was also interesting to watch when the interns or doctors came in and she was playing, how it affected them. You would see, I have pictures of where their shoulders start changing shape and they, you can see everybody's gonna listen to the music just for a few minutes. So she does this for people in the hospital all the time. This is um, a wonderful, wonderful Rick Bertel, a good friend. One day I called him up you know, and said, not a good day, Rick. We need some help here. And so Rick went out. And the next thing I know, the doorbell rings, and he's got red flowers and cherries. And um, we decorated the house. We had a huge cherry festival. And it was an, am an amazing and moving experience when people, um, that's the gift of really good friends. You call them and you say, you know, I need your help. And that's helping. It helps you, but it also helps them. Because so many times people say, what can I do for you. Well, in that instant, maybe not anything, but if I'm comfortable enough to call you on the bad days, that's good. This is a great quote that we found from John Kabat-Zinn, um, which bridges compassion and, um, and being joyful, which is the next section. And um, it's just that moment that the best way to help others is to, to be happy, is to participate meaningfully in their lives and in your lives and undertaking a larger or a larger framework of your life so that you you move forward. And John is one of the great writers of this. Um, do what gives you joy. There is no question that the greatest joy I have is teaching at the Dallas Museum of Art. And um, this is when I'm teaching my art and medicine class. And there I am waving my arm. I can't believe somebody caught it. But it is that moment of ecstasy as far as I'm concerned. And it is a gift that the museum gives to me that they let me into the galleries and often with very large groups. But we have a wonderful time. And I love the collection so much that it's um, an important part of my life. Um, and that says what? 10 minutes, no time. 10, okay, 10 minutes, all right. <laughs> there we go, I'm gonna look at Katrina, 10 minutes, okay. Joy, um, joy is a source of power, and you shouldn't forget that. Um, it's a source of your personal power. If you're happy, aren't you experiencing the world very differently than you are when it's sad and gloomy, um, or you're troubled? So I look for things, um, like a friend who has plants hundreds of tulips. And then, of course, when I go out there, I want to find the one tulip that's not like all the other tulips as I go chomping through them and, um, and smelling them. And I learned that tulips have no smell. But, um, you know, <laughs> but those are important things to learn in life. You, know? you, you can't just have them all by yourselves. Um, I have a group of friends who celebrate life every Friday and um, are so important to me and to each other. Um, the way we help each other and the way we host each other is a gift. And uh, the joy they brought into my life and the comfort they brought into my life is unbelievable. So um, I thank all of them, but mostly, you know, they're, they're the early warning <laughs> They'll, on Friday, they'll know how I'm doing. I don't like to talk about that. The, um, the thing that gives me the greatest joy now is being with my grandchildren. 
no question about it. And so um, I've taken my granddaughter, Franny, to the Met many times. She's now equipped to say, what do you want to see, Franny? Jackson Pollock, Nana, of course. And, and Fran uh, Clark went for the very first time, and he said, what is this, Nana? And I said, well, what do you want to see? And he said, do they have swords? And so, of course, we went to Arms and Armors, and they're a great you, uh, you know, hold cases of swords, and he never wanted to leave. He took my cane and was uh, taking over the arm, um, arms and armor court, and I'm just like, oh, no. But um, it's just the greatest thing for me to be with them and to share with them. And, of course, ice cream. Um, there, every day is a good... Let me just exclaim that. Every day is a good day of ice cream. <laughs> Not just one day. Um, now I'm into moving forward. Um, I um, saw Dr. Abba White today, who is my wound specialist, and unfortunately I had a terrible fall a year and a half ago, and he had to take care of me for a year and two months before the wounds healed, and there were a lot of them, but he just never gave up. Um, he constantly tortured me, but when we were done, we hugged, <laughs> hugged each other because it was an important celebration for both of us. And that day, I came to the DMA, and I had injured both legs in the fall, and I was able to actually walk up the stairs from one level to another, which was a huge accomplishment for me. Um, I did hold on to the railing, so DMA friends, don't fret. Um, at the encouragement of uh, I, many people, I took up, uh, I have hired a personal trainer. <laughs> cute personal trainer, let me just clarify that, uh, who specializes in complicated, um, complicated um, uh, people that he works with. So um, there I am, and it, it's terrifying, but I'm glad I'm doing it. Um, I have started writing my book, and it's a slow and painful process, but we're making cases. Uh, the biggest problem is Perseus, as you can see there, who lays in front of the desk, and pushes delete all the time. And so I have learned to save much more than anybody else. Being playful um, is one of the practices, part of the practice that I love. And I, I have a collection of ducks, which make me very happy. But it's many things that we can do in life that are playful. Um, nourishing relationships. Uh, there's this great new book uh, by um, the, called The Gathering, written by Prior... Hyra Parker about how to bring convening people, whether it's business or socially in, the, in, our, in our century. It's the um, wonderful, wonderful book. And we were having lunch at a friend's, Barbara's house, Barbara, one of my friends. And whenever she has lunch, everybody says yes, and they all show up. <laughs> it's always funny. So I gave everybody, everybody a, a book, a copy of the book, which was great. Um, always be grateful. Now, what have I done? Okay. <laughs> I didn't touch it. There, here comes Oscar. No. Here comes Oscar. He sees it. He's out there. I'm sorry. So how many of you have done, think about your life while Oscar comes and saves the day again? Do things new in your life. Not necessarily. How many of you are playful? Yay. So playful. How? Um, I think at the lake, taking pictures of the sunrise. Every morning, Looking right. Yeah. Black comedy, okay. What, can you tell us one more thing? Black comedy, who else had their hand up? There was a bunch of hands, in the, yes. Right there, in the black. There you go. Love hide and seek, it's one of the great games. I play hide and seek in life. Who's over there? <laughs> sorry, Roger, I'm sorry. Okay, always be grateful. That's where we were. He's just trying to... <sighs> okay. Oh, yay, Oscar. <laughs> um, embracing solitude. Um, a lot of time now, um, I'm a very social person. I love going out. Um, I love being with people. So a new thing that happens when you're sick, you can't always do that. So I had to learn how to embrace solitude, how to be alone with myself and be happy. Solitude is not loneliness. Solitude can be a very creative part of your practice of living. And it's something um, that meditation has helped with, being creative and playful by myself has helped with. So um, I have a lot of stories about solitude that are, have helped me in my 
healing process. Very important, not everything something new is something good. Uh, <laughs> this is a very famous day here at the Center for Brain Health when the fire alarms went off and we were on the third floor and I unfortunately had had shots in both knees and could be just barely walk. And when we looked at the top of the stairs going downward, I thought, this is not gonna work. So we got down one level and then suddenly I stopped and poor Steve who was with me trying very gently, the fire alarm's going off, honey, we have to get out of here. I stopped and said, oh no, look at how beautiful this is. Look at the shapes and the forms and, <laughs> and, look, and look at this and look at that. And Steve's going, what is going on here? Um, but later he realized it was actually a wonderful gift. And I learned an important lesson that what I needed to do was sit down and just tell Steve if it was a real fire, they'll come and get me, you know. I, they, we, <laughs> don't, don't try to walk down all those stairs. Uh, documentation is uh, very important. And so all of my friends, and you can tell from this PowerPoint, I take pictures all day long. And that is, uh, and then I record on my iPhone the day, that daily event. And I post it on Instagram. And at the end of the year, I print it all out. So I have a record of it. Otherwise, it would, you know, it would just disappear. And so um, the reason I do it, um, Franny plays chess, so don't, um, and won last weekend, so that was not good news, um, is because it helps me to celebrate, connect, and create. And those things in my life are really important. They're at the essence of something new. But it also helps to renew my life. Um, it helps me with my recovery, and most importantly, with resilience, um, to get up. That's the... Gumby, vision of Gumby that I have of myself. You know, I get knocked down and we just pow, pounce right up. Not always immediately, but <laughs> do it. Um, I've learned that um, something new requires intention. I have to make a plan for that day. It may not be um, specific, but uh, sometimes I'll wake up and say, I'm going to study the color yellow and take photographs of yellow, or today is about compassion. And um, when I go to bed at night, I think about that for the next day rather than think about being sick. Um, and it also requires being present. It means you have to be aware of what's going on around you. It's just not going to disappear. And I love this new painting at the DMA, which is extraordinary uh, because it's so realistic, but you feel those doves actually are in the flowers are moving. And um, I, I think that that is a, an important part of life, that just abundance of opportunities that we have. There are dozens of books, millions of books out there that in studies that have been written, here are some that I really have loved, but there are many more, and I was trying to figure out how to show this slide, but um, I am going to do, with the help of Jenny um, in 2019, uh, we're going to have a series of workshops, if, if people sign up, where we're going to do the Something New practice. So each week we'll take a couple of the activities in here being playful or study, uh, 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 solitude and explore those both from a brain science point of view, but also from um, the practice in your life. And you, you go, hopefully by the end of the sessions, you'll be up and running and doing something new all on your own. So that's my goal. Um, there are amazing programs here at the Center for Brain Health. And I know that a flyer is um, on your desk and can be handed out, but I think that there are wonderful talks on mindfulness and practical sessions. There's a great new uh, program on heart variability, which has been introduced uh, that deals with people who have high stress and the eye rest meditation practice, which is um, also a cl very clinically proven one uh, training about stress reduction. So there's a lot here that they have and resources already set up. Um, of course, like life, it's a journey, not a destination. And I hope to continue doing my something new practice every day because I know I have 1,440 minutes. So there's nothing that I can, uh, no way I can have an excuse. And I hope, oh, see if I just, I was doing so well. Um, I have, I post every day on Instagram. Uh, for those of you who have Instagram and want to follow me, that you can also do it on Facebook, but I'm less 
skill. I don't always do that as well. But um, and I hate Facebook, so um, <laughs> has a lot into it. Uh, or you can email me. So I hope this is gotten you inspired to think about your life and to try one new thing tomorrow. Um, and I know a lot of you have done new things by coming here tonight, but it's been my honor and privilege to be here. And again, I thank my wonderful friends and uh, colleagues who came out to support me too. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Oh, <laughs> Come <on>. thank you. <coughs> and we and we have about five minutes for questions, but in case you left keys, a Ford connected to a pen, mm -hmm. you won't go far. So check in for the key. No, you go. okay, awesome. So any questions for Bonnie? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, that's a, another whole project in my life. I, um, <clears throat> at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, um, I teach first and second year uh, medical students a whole program on the art power of observation, how to look at works of art to develop their clinical uh, diagnostic skills to, through co close examination to develop their uh, ability to collaborate, not something medical students know how to work together to come up with new ideas and listen to other points of view, to um, also develop uh, their a better understanding of empathy and compassion. And you can teach all of this through works of art and through the activities that I do with them. And I, my class is now in the fourth fourth year, and <clears throat> and it's uh, been a, a great success over there. And out of that, I've developed a whole new framework for observing that is something else that I'm working on. I don't have time to be a museum director anymore. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. If it doesn't get cured in six months, you're on the list. <laughs> It's AIDS, it's, you know, mental illnesses, it's all of these diabetes. I mean, it's, you know, a huge range, and that's why it affects so many people. Yes? In your solitude, and learning to embrace that, are you in silence or do you like to be Oh, I do everything. You know, sometimes I just like to be alone. Um, in my house, I'm never alone because I have two kitties who um, activate my life in their own way. But a, a lot of a lot of days are quiet, what I call quiet days. And so I may or may not listen to music, but I'm perfectly content. Sometimes my brain just needs to rest. And I also find that to be some of my most creative time because my head really starts thinking about new things. I get It's kind of like being repotted. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody does it differently, but you know, that that's a, a, a great question because <clears throat> because it is an important one. Yeah, somebody over there. Uh huh. Well, some of them were up there, but I couldn't uh, honestly couldn't get all of them up there, if you can believe it. But. Um, I think the power of friendship, um, you know, there's so many examples of that, but one of them really has been how um, the nurturing care of people, uh, certainly in terms of an experience, for me there were two. One was going to the baseball game, um, which was totally out of my zone of understanding. And yesterday I went to the Perot Museum and saw this just absolutely amazing dinosaur exhibition. And I know a little bit about dinosaurs, but I can tell you, you should all go to see this show because it, this is the dinosaurs in Africa and South America, which are recently, it's recent discoveries. It's a whole great, brave new world. So often, you know, if I think about it, there are so many examples, and that's the gift of having recorded them. If I hadn't recorded them, I wouldn't remember as well. Going through the slides, going through my 46,000 images to make this slide presentation for tonight was a revelation to me. Yeah. 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 
Well, one of the things I do is, you know, there are great Dharma tapes. I have a couple that I highly recommend where they do a Dharma talk and then you practice the meditation after that. And that's always helpful. Um, sometimes I do meditation at night to go to sleep because it quiets my mind. But if you, um, I always, it's, I don't go to sleep when I'm meditating because I remember, um, can, may I touch your back? Um, I used to practice Zen Buddhism, Zen practice, and they have a long stick, the teachers do, and when your head nods down, they go boom, like that. <laughs> Only not as gently as I did to you, and you wake up. Um, so, and it's, one of the things when your mind drifts off, and that's probably the most frequent thing, it just wanders, what you need to do is note that and then just bring it back. Because the monkey brain, the gro grocery list, what do I need to do with my children, you know, um, what do I need to do tomorrow happens, but you don't worry about that. It's being attending to that and then bringing it back as a note and focusing again on the meditation and on your breath. It's interesting to me that I chose <coughs> meditation as my pr a primary role in my healing practice because it's the most painful thing that I experience every day. My lungs, every time I breathe in and out, it's like thousands of knives going in and out. So focusing on your breath was a challenge, and I had to find a way to do that without experiencing the pain. Yeah. One last one. No, <laughs> I wish I could tell you. Um, several people have asked me that. No, I'm, you know, not a religious person. I practice Buddhism. Buddhism is not a, a religion, and um, it's probably a good answer. <laughs> I'm true to myself. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Way in the back. I haven't printed all my photographs. That's kind of scary to think about. But, um, but every year, uh, at the end of the year, I print out that year of notes from my, um, and then it's just you know stapled together and put in a colored folder with the calendar of that year and put away. Yeah. Hi, what's the mechanics of writing? The, when you experience the new mm -hmm. thing every day, do mm -hmm. you immediately write it down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I take a pic. I'm. A, I have a visual memory. I, you know, I. When I go now to write those experiences, we're talking about one or two lines that are the notes. But I can recall things in enormous detail, like the day I told Cinderella's story to my grandchildren in the middle of Walgreens and launched into. <laughs> 30 people watching me, walking up and down the aisles, and I'm telling my grandchildren on FaceTime the Cinderella story. So it's just, you know, I don't write them down. I just, I think that's why the photographs are, and the documentation are so important. Just little notes. So it's 8 o'clock, so thank you all so much, yep. Bonnie, from your friends in yeah. Dallas. Thank you. And you're a treasure. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Hand for Bonnie. <laughs> Technical difficulties of the highest order. I'm sorry. Next time I'm going to give you the flipper. Yeah. Huh? Yeah.